Tabloids are a product of our generation. You'd be wrong. A tabloid is born next Wednesday at 9 on BBC4. How long was your career in television, Great Uncle Bulgaria? Well, 32 years in total, from 68 to 2000. So, why have you retired? Ah, well, one rules recycling policy, making good use of the things that we find, was well ahead of its time, but now the world has begun to take notice of our message. Would you consider a return to children's TV? Well, of course, if people still need a helping paw with recycling. However, I think that the young generation are very environmentally aware these days. It, oh, phone. Ah, yeah. oh, hello, Bono. Can I ring you back? Children's TV on trial. A new season coming soon to BBC Four. Edwardian movers and shakers on BBC Four. Dan Snow is on a personal journey into the world of his great-great-grandfather, David Lloyd George. Getting to grips with the Edwardian period is an elusive task for a historian. The dawn of the last century is tantalisingly close, but it's receding fast. There are some obvious ways in, whether it's the romantic imagery of a golden age as served up to us in the paintings of John Sargent, or through the merchant ivory version of E.M. Forster's world. The material remains, too, are all around us. The architecture, the fashion, the London tube, and the modern department store all powerfully iconic of this age of transition. Some of us can access it via our own families, only a couple of generations away. As it turns out, I can boast possibly the biggest Edwardian figure of them all. I'm here in the members' lobby of the Houses of Parliament, and believe it or not, that is my great-great-grandfather, David Lloyd George, the last Liberal Prime Minister. And it's not just members of my immediate family that consider him to be one of the greatest figures of the Edwardian age. While I'm fascinated by my ancestor, I want to know something more tangible about his world. Luckily, the Edwardians left me the means to do this. They were great collectors of data about themselves and their lives. It's one of their greatest legacies, statistics galore. They are a testament to an obsession that gripped the age, a lust for self-knowledge and heaven for the historian. The meatiest data comes from the census, the doomsday book of the modern era. They'd started in 1801, but the 1911 census was a monster, more than 12 times the size of the previous one in 1901. It recorded the lives of 35 million people in 35,000 volumes and occupies some two kilometers of shelving. It's frustrating that this treasure trove won't be open to the public until 100 years are up in 2012. But luckily, the Edwardians analyzed this mass of data and condensed it into a series of parliamentary papers, the so-called blue books. Down to a modest 35 volumes, they're stored at the top of the Victoria Tower in the House of Lords. What they yield is spectacular. For the first time, I can find real empirical precision to help answer the big questions of the age. Who got rich? Who was poor? Who was on the rise? And who was on the fall? But it goes way beyond the big picture. The amount of detail about everyday life is fascinating. Well, I've come up here to the Act Room of the House of Lords, where every single act passed by Parliament in the last 500 years is stored. And also in here are these wonderful 
blue books and the information in here is all got from the census of 1911 and social historian Juliette Garner is here to help me understand what all this means and the first thing we found is this extraordinary uh, reduction in the number of people involved in agriculture, Juliet? It's 1.4 million there, right down to 900,000. I mean, that's a 37% decrease. Farming has changed, basically. It's, if you like, the first globalisation. It's a revolution. Landowners were very large-scale farmers, but they had been producing, basically, for a domestic market. And all of a sudden, food is coming in from uh, abroad, from the great wheat bowls of Canada and America, and farmers were losing their livelihood. In fact, 80% of the country's grain was coming in from outside, along with 40% of its meat. The Blue Book tells us that by 1911, arable land declined almost 13% in 20 years. Now, this must have hit the aristocracy pretty hard because, of course, they own much of this land. Of course. By 1900, a large number of landed estates were on the market. They just couldn't sustain them anymore. So it was a case of adapt or die. As ever. So who adapted and who went under? And if the land was no longer able to fund the great estates, what I want to know is what the enterprising aristocrat was doing to keep the cash coming in. And it wasn't as if the nation itself was on its uppers. At the beginning of the 20th century, the British Empire remained the most economically powerful force in the world, controlling 31% of the world's trade in manufactured goods. But productivity slowed. It grew at less than half the rate of the Victorian period, allowing the rest of the industrialised world, particularly Germany and America, to catch up. Britain had to find new ways to make money. The evidence is clear here in the Blue Books. What you were seeing was actually the great financial um, revolution, a growth of the managerial, the administrative sort of level. Look at this one, a huge commercial business clerks, go from 181,000 up to 477, that's a huge number. Of course, all finance generates a huge sort of ancillary industry, if you like, for so women. Women take an increasing role in these new industries. The, yes, that's right. There's a great desire, I think, for a lot of young women not to go into service. And, of course, what we really see, the big expansion, is of women in offices. This is Puta's world, described in Diary of a Nobody, an expanding lower middle class made up of the typist, the clerk and the commuter. It's fascinating to see it so clearly through the statistics on the page. Presumably all these new men and women with a bit of money to spend, this is what's creating this consumer boom. Exactly. They're buying things which previously they would have made. Women who would have made their own hats before now are wanting to have a new hat. Now, of course, that's opportunities for them, but it's a huge opportunity, of course, for the manufacturers. So men like Boot, Sainsbury's, um, th this is a new generation of super rich people. Yeah, enormously wealthy people, and people, of course, who are beginning to enjoy real social prestige and power. I mean, for example, the grocer, Sir Thomas Lipton, was a very close friend of the king. These were the new powerhouses of Britain, and the king recognised that. The aristocrats must have hated these nouveau riche merchants. Not only were they super rich, but now the king was giving them respectability as well. Fascinating. I really want to find out more about these turn-of-the-century millionaires. How did they make their money, and how did they buy their way into the establishment, if indeed they did? One thing's for sure, they certainly didn't believe in spreading their money around. Clearly, the Edwardian period is not all roses. Here are the... Uh the numbers for the workhouse establishments, the, the paupers in the workhouse. Are, it feels far more Victorian than the other stuff we've been talking about today. Interestingly, the biggest single group of inmates is the over 65s. And I, I think one in three of the over 75s across Britain was actually in the poorhouse, weren't they? Yeah. Well, I think that shows us, in fact, how so many you know, working people, even people who'd worked all their lives, actually could not, they could just about struggle to keep their head above water while they were working. But, you know, when they were old, they, um, you know, there was old age pensions after all weren't introduced till, till 1908. So they weren't able to make any provision for old age. And contrary to what some of we th thought, I think, that, you know, every, all families all lived together and granny and grandpa in the corner, as it were, it wasn't true. A lot of families families just could not support elderly members and they would actually go into institutions. But of course, one thing the Edwardian period is, is famous for is, is the beginning of the introduction of things like pensions and a look, a changing attitude towards pauperism, isn't yes. it? Yes. What was happening in the Edwardian period was, of course, there was the rise of trade unions, looking into working conditions and wages. And of course, we think of the Edwardian period as a placid golden age of, of, mm. of, of manners and politeness, but actually there was a huge amount of industrial action. Yes, of course. It was a period of great industrial unrest. 
people trying to establish not only wage differentials, but also trying to guarantee some security of employment and the sort of things that would stop somebody falling down into this sort of pit. Hardly surprising when at the time these blue books were compiled, an unskilled man earned on average £62.40 per year, the equivalent of £3,500 today. But of course another thing was social investigators. I mean, there were these people like um, Charles Booth and Henry Mayhew who produced really very comprehensive surveys. And we've been looking here at the census of the Blue Book. I mean, this sort of statistical information, this scientific approach, as it were, to welfare was really something that appealed to the Edwardians. So life for the working class was still pretty grim. But people were beginning to notice and suggest that things perhaps should change. But for the working class themselves, it was money that was at the heart of the matter. They wanted some more, but they weren't saying, please, sir. I really want to find out more about the radical voices who were driving these demands in the trade union movement. And the middle class chroniclers of the living conditions of the poor and down and out. Who were these social investigators and what motivated them? Well, Juliet, thanks very much for helping me interpret these blue books. Now, you crack on with these scrolls. I'm going to do a bit of social investigating for myself. One of the things that the blue books have shown me is that unlike Victorian times, when everyone knew their place, social position in Edwardian Britain is much trickier to pin down. The two things that people from all the classes seem to be grappling with in this Edwardian period are status, and money. The working class have got none of either and they want some. The middle class are actually getting quite a lot of money and now they want the status. The aristocracy have got all the status they need but they're getting worried about money. To test this little hypothesis, I'm going to go for a trip around the country to look into some personal stories of people right across the social divide. The characters I'm after aren't just typical of their class. Rather, they should be men and women who help define the period. I'm looking for the movers and shakers, and I want to feel I could shake their hand. This was still a hierarchical world, so the obvious place to start my journey is with the aristocracy. This is a world in which I would expect to find all those things which we so commonly associate with the age. Elegance, refinement, the English country house at its most sublimely unruffled. Snow-bound Ingestry Hall in Staffordshire is the seat of Lord Shrewsbury, the Earl of Talbot. He's the Premier Earl of England and Ireland. Hi, James. Let's go. Shame about the windscreen wipers. This car is a 1910 Talbot 12 horsepower and is being driven by James Fack, a Talbot car enthusiast. Talbot Cars, one of the most successful British car manufacturers, was set up by the 20th Earl of Shrewsbury for a reason that says a lot about the position of the landed class at the time. Now, this was not normal for an aristocrat of this period. Why was he doing this? When he inherited the earldom as a 17-year-old schoolboy at Eton, it was 1877, and it was the year that the terrible agricultural depression of the late 19th century first hit he is on record as saying he couldn't live within his private income of 100,000, 1880 pounds a year. So he went out to um, augment his income in, in trade. So tell me a bit more about this company that the Earl set up. He founded the Shrewsbury and Talbot Hansom Cab Company, the largest hansom cab company in London. And then in 1902, he went into manufacture. Who's buying these kinds of cars? probably the sort of BMW buyers of today. Uh, it was a sort of upper mid-range car. You've got the Earl's symbol on the cars, on the radiator badge, on the wheel hub nuts. He opened uh, motor shows. He was on the Talbot stand at the motor shows, so you could buy your car from the Premier Earl of England. Quite unusual to be an entrepreneurial aristocrat at this point. I mean, was he looked down on by his peers? Yes, he was very much looked down on. He was struck off every guest list in London. Luckily for Shrewsbury, I suppose, the king was actually quite a fan of this kind of stuff, wasn't he? 
Well, I think so. I think the royal visit to Ingastri that was, took place over four days and nights in November 1907, it must have been a major turning point. Edward actually came here and stayed with him, didn't he? He did, yeah, and uh, I'm told that they sent a, a string of Talbot cars to the station to go and pick him up. They still got photographs in the town hall there of the royal visit passing through Utoxeter. I think a lot of interesting things were um, taken on board during that week, including a wonderful rabbit shoot. They managed to shoot well in excess of 2,000 rabbits on one particular day. He was lucky that he had a king that was prepared to encourage, you know, his, his leading aristocrats to go into trade. I think he was very lucky that that was the situation. People must have realised that this was an evil necessity. And I know that a number of years later, um, another belted earl went into second-hand cars. So, you know, things changed fairly rapidly after that. <laughs> Our blue books give us a precise picture of just how quickly the car took over. Between 1902 and 1911, the number of people employed in coach and carriage making decreased by 24%, whilst those employed driving or attending motor vehicles increased by a staggering 6,817%. Like all great entrepreneurs, Lord Shrewsbury had the right idea at the right time. The motor car was exciting new technology. Every three years, the value of motor car imports doubled. And throughout the whole of the Edwardian period, 198 new makes of car were launched on the British market. All this talk about vintage cars has given me an idea about how to continue my journey in style. My next stop is back down south, where I've arranged a meeting at the Birch Hanger service station with Dave Chapman, another Talbot car enthusiast. Well, I had my heart set on driving that little beauty around the UK, but it wasn't meant to be. And as it turns out, the 1910 Talbot isn't the only game in town. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Well, this is where we leave you behind. OK. Thank you very much, Lewis Hamilton. <laughs> Enjoy it. Bring it back in one place. Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> Very spacious, is it, Dave? This stunning 1985 60 horsepower Talbot Horizon will be my wheels for the rest of the trip. Excellent, thanks. Can you, go, can you pass me a crash helmet, please? <laughs> Not a bad little go of this, although uh, it gives a little bit more leg room. Anyway, back to the Edwardians. What the, the Talbot story is already teaching me is that attitudes to money are changing. Led by the king, who's encouraging his aristocrats to find different streams of revenue to support their status, money is becoming fashionable. And that is great news for the merchant class because they're now making loads of it. In the 1850s, nearly all the millionaires in the country were drawn from the aristocrats or the landed gentry. By the early 1900s, nine out of 10 millionaires are from the non-landed classes. But can the nouveau riche really buy the respectability they crave? And what kind of attitude should they have to their own money if they want to enter the establishment? Should they share the aristocratic disdain for the filthy lucre, or should they openly enjoy their wealth? Well, I'm heading down to West London to follow the stories of a couple of property developers, the brothers JT and Gus Mears, who made a fortune by tracking the construction of the London Tube. Hopefully I'll find some answers in their story. Now, the Mears boys realised that wherever the tube line went, a property boom followed, and they made a lot of cash around here, Fulham Broadway, in property speculation. They also started a football club. Its name was Chelsea. Blue is the is the Blue is the but 
because there was big money in leisure, and particularly football, the people's game. Attendances regularly topped 60,000. So here we are in the shadow of Stamford Bridge, appropriate final resting place of uh, Gus Mears. Rick, you know more than anyone else about the history of Chelsea. Who were the Mears boys? Well, they're the founding dynasty of Chelsea Football Club, and Henry Augustus, known as Gus, is the, called the father of the club. And I think he was part of that breed, along with his brother, JT, who had the, the vision to see what was happening to the world around them. You know, you've got the railway line over here, where the London Athletic Club had uh, historically been. The Athletic Club, was uh, where Stamford Bridge is now, was in financial difficulties, and they kind of stepped in, saw an opportunity, and thought, well, either they're going to build houses on it, which was happening all around railway tracks and tube lines at the time, or they were going to kind of realise a dream and maybe build a sports arena there. So they bought all the property around the London Athletic Club and then just decided what to do with it. Why football? In 1888 the Football League is set up and there isn't a single football club south of the Midlands. And to someone who was living in London and seeing uh, these working classes suddenly with, you know, after the trade unions had had an impact, they got more time, workers have got more time on their hands. They've also got a bit more money in their pockets. And football isn't really that commercially organised in London, so there's a fantastic opportunity. Football drew huge crowds like no other spectacle. 114,000 people turned up for the 1901 FA Cup final. What's more, you could charge through the nose. The average entrance fee was six pence, double the price of other forms of entertainment like the cinema and music hall. So the crowds were predominantly drawn from the skilled working and lower middle classes who would stop work on a Saturday at 1 p.m., thus creating the three o'clock kickoff time. But despite the vast crowds and the relatively expensive admittance fee, the maximum wage for the players was a mere four pounds a week. So there was lots of money to be made from a successful and well-run football club. Wow, <laughs> so this is it. Quite an achievement, isn't it? We're lucky, really, that we've got a football club here at all because the Mears family, once they'd bought the land, were in two minds what to do with it. Their first priority was to see what money they could make from it. You know, this whole area here was uh, thick with sand. I mean, from about a foot below the surface of the water table, solid sand. So it's typical of the Mears family. Not only are they shifting all of this sand from here and getting a shilling a load for it, but with the great infrastructural things that are happening in the locality, you've spoil needed to be shifted. So they would get paid a shilling a load to get rid of that spoil, and they would use the same spoil to build the banking that would film this great bowl that was the stadium. And then they built a huge grandstand, so the kind of gentry that they wanted to attract yeah. would sit in this stand, and the rest of the sort of working class hordes were on the banking that was built on the spoil from the trams and the tubes. So they were shifting sand and getting paid for it, and they were bringing in spoil and getting paid for that as well. Yeah, not a bad little deal, that, is it? Nice. So this idea that sort of football has its roots in the amateur past is nonsense. These were a couple of entrepreneurs who just created a club from scratch. <laughs> I mean, you look at the stadium now, we have uh, the richest owner in the world, Roman Abramovich, you know, buying players from all over the world, and really, what, that's what the Mears family were trying to do in 1905. Is this all part of football, of course, becoming massively popular in this whole Edwardian period? Well, if you think about the fact that in the Victorian period, uh, sport was getting more organised, national rules were coming in, but really, in the Edwardian period, I think what you get is the commercialisation of it, the exploitation of those rules that have been set in place. And football was best place to do this because it was classless. Chelsea, Chelsea, you know I love you. Chelsea, Chelsea, I'm thinking of you. You've got something that makes me want to follow. They don't do anything by halves, these Mears brothers. They need a great team. And so what they do is they cherry-picked great players. Uh, among uh, Fatty Fuchs? 
Batty Falk is a phenomenon of football at that time. I mean, he was a, a huge man, a man mountain. Chelsea marketed him very expertly. They would have photos taken of him next to ball boys either side of the goal. Tiny little men, great big bloke, 23 stones, six foot two. And uh, yeah, it says he weighs in at 22 stone and is a finer specimen of manhood has ever stepped on the field. <laughs> in spite of his bulk, he possesses all the activity as a cat combined with the playfulness of a kitten. Everyone talks about you. I knew it from the start. And it's a successful experiment, this. It works, doesn't it? They get elected straight into the uh, Football League Division 2. Within two seasons, they're in the top division. And there's uh, intense excitement ab about this, uh, this new club that's arrived. And for the Mears boys, some really superstardom. They're sitting up there, they've got the big cigars on. JT's got his red carnation in his lapel. And tipping people and getting all their cronies in, the great and the good from London. Sort of buying their way into the establishment. First thing that jumps out of me, it's fascinating, is all the um, the posh knobs they've got on the, on the board and stuff. Vice President, the President, the Right Honourable Earl of Cadogan. Well, uh, and this is, you know, the programme in itself is, is interesting because it's marketing the whole image, but the fact that these people are on your masthead, you know, it shows how aspirant Chelsea were. It's the beginnings of corporate hospitality as we know it today. That's the way that Chelsea Football Club was set up, to, to sort of ostentatiously show what money can do and what a great lifestyle you can have. Gus Mears, the older brother, died in 1912 and it was left to JT to consolidate the dynasty. He became one of the most successful businessmen in London where everything he touched turned to gold. When he dies in 1935, he leaves the equivalent of 1.5 billion pounds, a lot of which came from the Chelsea scenario. And, and not just that, he, he became a sort of member of the establishment in many ways, didn't he? Well, the money is one thing, but he ended up the mayor of Richmond. And to someone like JT Mears, that's a massive achievement. That's a life's work. And that's one of the reasons why he set out with this great project of Stamford Bridge, because he wanted that status. What the Mears brothers' story tells me is that if you have the cash, it seems you can have it all. A good time, prestige, even the attention of the king. I'm surprised how modern the Edwardian attitude to money is. But at the same time, their attitude to their employees, the footballers, has changed little from the great mill owners of Victorian times. In 1916, just a few years after putting Chelsea on the football map, Fatty Fook was making a few pennies, saving penalties on Blackpool Sands, where he caught pneumonia and died. He was just 42 years old. The Mears brothers made a fortune from the people's game, but most of the working class couldn't even afford the price of a ticket to a football match. Indeed, many of them couldn't count on three square meals a day, and if you were born in a slum, you had a one in three chance of dying in infancy. I'm a pretty tall guy, about six foot six in fact, and that would have made me a giant back in Edwardian times. And back then, size mattered because it was connected to class. The upper and middle classes would have been literally able to look down on their workers. Someone born in poverty would on average have been five inches shorter than somebody born into the well-fed classes. So, while the middle class are doing well, the poor are doing as badly as always. In the early 1900s, if you were down on your luck, there was still no old age pension or state assistance to bail you out. And this is where many of those poor people who relied on handouts ended up. The workhouse. Old people in particular dreaded spending their last days in these gloomy surroundings. And in reality, a surprising number of them did. It really is the only place, if you were totally destitute, that you could rely on a bed and a roof over your head. The workhouse was really the place that you didn't 
talk about in polite society. So there was a great sense of shame in, in, in having to resort to the workhouse. Only 3% were really uh, habitual vagrants. Single mothers with children often formed a significant proportion of the inmates, so they'd either been deserted by their husbands or they were widowed. In Edwardian Britain, it doesn't seem like there's a huge margin for safety. And I, I mean, lots of situations uh, that come up again and again. Domestic servant, for example, who manages to get pregnant, almost certainly will immediately get the, the sack from her job. Uh, she'll be unable to get another job, will end up in the workhouse, and again, be on a sort of spiral down into poverty. Our blue books bear this out with some startling figures. In 1911, of the 103,000 women in the workhouse, 19,000 of them, or more than 18%, were former domestic servants. Worrying about down and outs rivals collecting statistics as an Edwardian obsession. Led by a new breed of socially concerned and now highly educated women, many took that journey down into the abyss, not just to record it, but to drag it into daylight and change it. Other reformers were even more daring. They'd disguise themselves as paupers, then go and live undercover in the workhouse, surrounded by the poor and the down and out. Then they'd write books detailing their experiences in this scary world. One of the most influential of these investigators was the wife of a Congregationalist minister here at Oldham in Lancashire. Her name was Mary Higgs. Good morning. My sermon this morning is all about the personal milestones that Mary Higgs made. Who was Mary Higgs? She was the wife of one of the ministers of this church, the Reverend Thomas Kilpin Higgs. Mary became very involved in the life of Oldham. The 1890s were marked by a series of cotton strikes and of course this brought a great sense of destitution and hardship to many families. And Mary firmly believed in Paul's words that faith without deeds is useless. She didn't just want to help, she also wanted to look at the background issues of why there was these problems of poverty. And Mary then went on to devote her lifetime to looking at these issues. Mary Higgs's main concern was for the conditions women faced in the workhouses of the poor particularly in the mixed casual wards where people stayed for a couple of days at a time. In 1906, she disguised herself as a tramp and with a companion, spent five nights in a number of these casual wards. So what did Mary actually do with her findings when she returned home here to her comfortable parsonage? Well, actually quite a lot. She wrote books, pamphlets, took part in parliamentary inquiries. In short, Mary Higgs became one of the leading voices in the country on the plight of the poor and the women. The Oldham Local Studies and Archive have a large collection of Mary's papers and writings. I think my favourite one here is Five Days and Five Nights as a Tramp. She's obviously sent this copy to the uh, Oldham Library because the original postcard's still in it. This is a very early edition of her account that, of the time she spent in the casual ward and, and the workhouse. We see she's extremely concerned throughout this book about the morality of, of poverty and what poverty does to people, driving them into vice and the ways of Satan. Here's a, a section that I really caught my eye. At 11 o'clock, suddenly everyone came up to bed with a rush. It almost seemed as if they were coming on top of us, so great was the noise, and all was so near. The blind man stumbled in so close, and half a dozen people, all talking, got into bed close by. My companion woke frightened and clutched me. A candle flickering in the next compartment revealed a huge bug walking on the ceiling, which suddenly dropped over a neighbouring bed. By degrees, the noises subsided and my companion and I fell into an uneasy slumber. Really what comes out of this is the sense of terror, actually, which it is to be uh, a single woman um, amongst all these vagabonds and vagrants. Uh, they're not segregated at all, men and women sleeping together, and uh, through the night she hears all sorts of things which um, she declines to, uh, to define. I think we can imagine what that is. We can see here Mary was keen to make it as authentic as possible. Here's an exact list of all the money she spent and all the things she ate, and of course, it's really not that much at all. At the end of her adventure, she's almost overwhelmed with happiness to be safe and to have decent food and clean clothes. She thinks about a life in poverty, and she says this. 
Before us would have stretched in grey monotony the life of poverty, a possible search for uncertain work, a gradual pawning of every available article for food, more workhouses, more common lodging houses, the last article gone, cleanliness lost, clothing dilapidated or dirty, what then? To wander helpless and homeless, driven to tramp or to descend still further into vice. From such a life, faculis descensus averni, which is a quote from Virgil, meaning the road to hell is easy. And that final sentence sums up Mary's deep concern uh, for paupers and women. And reading it today, I'm still struck by the power and the anger. And surprised too to find this kind of writing at the beginning of the 20th century, when I had previously associated it with people like George Orwell in the 1930s. But it wasn't just the spiritual and social welfare of the poor women that concerned her. Mary was part of a vanguard of newly educated women. In 1910, there were only a thousand female students in Oxbridge, and they had to obtain special permission to attend lectures and couldn't get a degree. Mary taught in a girls' grammar school and was a passionate advocate for educating women of all classes. When it came to education, Mary knew what she was talking about. She was one of the most highly educated women of the era. She was actually the very first woman to study natural sciences at Cambridge. So to find out a bit more, I'm going to go to her old college, Girton. So Kate, you're the archivist here at Girton College. What's your trawl through your collections found about Mary? Well, to start with this year photograph, she came up in 1871, which was very early in the college's history. It's very early for women's education, full stop. Very. She was one of a group of five in her year, and at that time, there were only 12 in the college altogether. Mary, who came up as Mary Kingsland, she became Mary Higgs on marriage, read Natural Sciences, and uh, she was the first woman to actually sit the Natural Sciences Tripos in 1874. Amazing how small the group was. Yes, and I think if you see here, there are only 12 in the college at that time. And so here she is with contemporaries. That, now, they're a small group. Did they feel like an elite group? What did they try and do to cultivate a sense of sort of team spirit? <laughs> well, I think they, they felt special. They knew that they were pushing the boundaries, that they were pioneers. They formed um, societies and they acted and they danced. They're keen to do all the things that, that the men are doing in their colleges. Absolutely, yes. So what's I mean, this? This is a, a book of college jokes and actually begun by Mary herself That's lovely, yeah, in 1872, Mary. so a year after she came. The first of many illustrious <laughs> books that she was to write. Yes. College so songs. College songs, poems, etc. So she's copied them out in her hand. This is one that we can say with certainty that Mary wrote. Wow, look at that. And it's a farewell song to Girton College. Farewell. God, this is, absolutely, this is magical. The, the farewell song to the, to the tune of the Canadian boat song. I'm not familiar with that. And the chorus, it's quite R&B, this is great. Go, sisters, go, the world is wide, and dangers many may you betide, but none from you our love shall hide. And it goes on and on. That's inspiring. Imagine it them is. all singing that when they leave. It is. And, of course, when they left, they all became extremely impressive people. Lots of them seemed to be intrinsically linked with this issue of looking at poverty, didn't they? Yes, I think they had a sense of the wider world and the issues they faced outside the college. And Mary, in particular, went on to look at poverty in a number of its guises. We do have a photograph of her wow, undercover. That, isn't that wonderful? There she is. This is for the memorial after. <clears throat> and that's actually a photograph of her going deep cover mm. amongst the poor people. And this was a memorial. This is in order to set up um, sheltered housing. That's wonderful, isn't it? Looking at the photograph of Mary Higgs undercover, 
up against the cigar-smoking J.T. Mears makes me think that this is a time when we're seeing the beginnings of a modern middle class with a widespread of opinion and lifestyle. The Mears brothers were propelled into the middle class through their love of money. Mary's class was defined by her education and her altruism. Mary Higgs and the other social investigators helped to change public opinion. Edwardians stopped blaming poor people for their own misfortunes. By this stage, my great-great-grandfather, David Lloyd George, was Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he proposed a series of radical reforms to help the poor, paid for by a super tax in his 1909 budget. But for the establishment, this was a step too far, and it caused a constitutional crisis. As Chancellor, Lloyd George had passed the Old Age Pensions Act of 1908, but now he wanted to go further. He wanted to set up a national insurance scheme so workers could pay money in and then get free health care, sick pay and insure themselves against unemployment. But this scheme was going to cost, and in his budget of 1909, Lloyd George proposed new taxes on land. What was it about this people's budget that was so revolutionary? I mean, Lloyd George believed the land belonged to the people, and therefore there was a great deal of moral fervour in demanding that the land should be the source from which these welfare schemes, for welfare schemes they were, should be financed. But it was land and unearned wealth that worried them. The fact that the aristocracy, the landowning classes, were enjoying privileges which, in their view, they hadn't earned. Because this, this, this clause here is terrifying for the aristocracy. You see this, uh, on the death of any person dying after commencement of this act, that meant death duties. A absolutely. These big a landed a estates. Absolutely. And as we know from every bill from then and now, not excluding the fox hunting bill five years ago, what touches the aristocracy, most of all, is impinging on their rights over their land. It's our land. And this produces a great emotional upsurge in people who own land for 1,500 years. And, of course, this bill led to a great constitutional crisis. I mean, the Lords dug in their heels and there was one hell of a fight. The House of Lords rejected the budget uh, on three, or in some senses, four occasions. And the House of Commons got very worried, at least the Treasury got very worried, because they weren't raising the money under the finance bill. And Lloyd George and Asquith very toughly said, we'll have to keep our nerve, we'll have to risk running out of money until it's backwards and forwards and we break their nerve. Ping-pong, as it's called, backwards and forwards. And Asquith and Lloyd George won. Their nerve held and the Lords didn't. But for a year, a year and a half, the House of Lords were digging their toes in and stopping any money being raised at all. It wasn't just in Parliament that the old order was being challenged. The Edwardian period was a time of frantic left-wing activity, particularly in London. The city housed Marxists from all over the world, plotting revolution at home and abroad. Lenin could often be found in the British Library between 1902 and 1911, organising revolution in Russia. Incidentally, he was just one of more than 373,000 foreign-born people registered in the Blue Books. But did Marxists like him have any real impact here? And if so, where? Here in what used to be the Battersea Town Hall, but's now the Arts Centre, a group of British Marxists of the Social Democratic Federation put together an umbrella group for all the factions on the left and called it the Progressive Alliance. They held on to power here in Battersea for nearly the whole of the Edwardian period. Forget about Red Ken, this was more like the Socialist Republic of Battersea. One of the most popular of Battersea's Progressive Alliance councillors was John Archer. In 1892, the left-wing, so-called Baron of Battersea, John Burns, aided by John Archer as his shrewd electoral agent, became the first Marxist elected to Parliament. It was Burns's Progressive Alliance who were the political masters of the borough, with Archer, the consummate backroom operator, pulling the strings. This mural that says something about Battersea at that time is really fantastic. Uh -oh. And if you look at it, one, one of the things that strikes me is that the whole thing utters this rhetoric of radicalism and innovation, because you've not only got the radical politicians, you've got women pilots and painters and, and so on. But, but if you begin there with Archer himself, with the wonderful handlebar moustache, Next to him is Burns, who was the Irish Catholic politician, 
and he led the Marxist Progressive Alliance. Next to him is Sharpurji Sakladvala, who was the communist MP. Archer was the agent for all these people. So you can and, imagine um, Archer in the back, the back room deals, the smoke-filled rooms, getting things done. Absolutely, that's how he learned his politics. When he was elected as a councillor in, in 1906, his reputation was of somebody who really cared about things like housing reform. Mm -hmm. He retained that interest throughout his whole life. He had this passionate concern about the conditions in which they lived. Well, let's talk a bit more about Archer's career actually as a politician rather than a fixer, but can we do that inside? It's getting a bit chilly out here. OK. We do have a pint. Tell me a bit more about his career in this area. One of these cuttings is a, this one here. There's a yeah. statue, of a, a statue of a dog. Exactly. Well, if you look at the statue of the dog, this dog was erected by the anti-vivisectionist tendency in, in, in Battersea. And there was a passionate debate around this, because when they put up this statue, the medical students uh, took offence, and a riot ensued <laughs> in which Archer was, a, was a, um, an, an important figure making a passionate speech against vivisection. He wasn't an ideologue. He took on causes. It's quite important that he's half Liverpool Irish and half black. He is comfortable in this area. He's comfortable with the politics. He's comfortable with the people that he's around. He slowly starts to take on sort of public roles, doesn't he? Yes, but he doesn't take on a public role immediately. It was his temperament to stand behind the throne and organize people and organize things and make things happen. So what was it that forced him to sit on the throne itself and become mayor? There were a number of fractures in the Progressive Alliance. Archer was a man who was acceptable to all sides. Archer may have been acceptable to all sides in Battersea, but the outside world was taken aback at the election of a black mayor. Although many of the 420 million people living in the British Empire were black, very few of them lived in Britain. The Blue Books of 1911 tell us that only 161,000 people in the British Isles were born in the colonies, and many of them were white. Anyway, Edwardian Britain was becoming a less welcoming place. 1905 saw the beginning of the Immigration Service. The Aliens Act aimed to curb the influx of Eastern European Jews, so it wasn't a great time to be foreign. But despite the quizzical press coverage of his election to mayor, John Archer wasn't foreign anyway. He was from Liverpool. The recurrent theme was that nobody knew where he came from. Nobody speculated that he could be a black British person. There's a great quote here. Says, I'm a son of a man who was born in the West Indies. I was born in a little obscure village in England that maybe you have never heard of. Liverpool. <laughs> I'm a Lancastrian bred and born. Yes, yes. And he was very concerned to, to point out that he was as British as anyone else. Some of these quotes are amazing. He's almost Shakespearean. He says, the color of my skin can never affect the heart. My election means a new era in history. The news will go forth to all the colored nations of the world. Do you think that the election of Archer becoming this first, uh, probably the first British um, man of color to be a mayor, do you think that that is a symbol of the sort of modernity of the Edwardian period? I think it was a symbol of the radicalism of Battersea. You would have taken it as entirely natural for this Irish Liverpudlian guy to be elected in, in, in an Irish Catholic um, setting. Um, but of course he was black. Archer's election was big news around the African diaspora. The black American thinker W.B. Du Bois reported it in his magazine, Crisis. In fact, Archer is respected and remembered more as part of black history in America than in the UK. 
The only copy of the photographs of Archer and his wife Bertha in their ceremonial robes are in the New York Public Library. But Archer was part of a small black London-based intelligentsia, led by the classical composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor, with its own agenda. I think lots of people are going to find it very surprising that during this Edwardian period there were a group of prominent black Britons um, doing these things, running for public office and, and debating these kind of issues. Well, here's the thing, Dan. I mean, we, we get continually taught about black history, and black history as if it was American, as if, or at best, as if it was a sort of generalised black diaspora. Where, whereas there's a very specific history of black British people. I think it was Archer's election said in a time when it was thought that people of colour couldn't rule themselves. Here's a person who can, within the headquarters of colonialism, become a significant and important political figure. Archer became engaged in pan-Africanism, in thinking about um, the rights of Africans and Caribbeans and so on. But to the people of Battersea, it wasn't the global figure that was important to them. It was Archer, the local politician. You know, if you want to sum up Archer as a person, I think you have to look at his funeral. He had a procession down Battersea um, Park Road, right through to the town hall. <laughs> the people who worked in the town hall all came out and lined the road. So there were these speeches, which were heartfelt. The MP, William Sanders, said that he thought that the reward of Archer's life was in his death because he left a multitude of friends and no enemies. Archer may or may not have been a Marxist, but what is obvious is that even in Battersea, the left in Britain was not as ideologically driven as in other parts of Europe. In fact, what Archer represents much more is clearly the beginnings of a black people's fight for equal rights. Even louder noises were being made by another group fighting for equality, the suffragettes. They were shocking the establishment with the ferocity of their tactics. But driving this unrest in the Edwardian period was the British Labour movement. They were leading a series of strikes that were building in intensity. Given that in the 1911 census, 75% of the population could be defined as working class, the establishment found the fact that these masses were now organising themselves pretty terrifying. In late Victorian times, there were fewer than a million trade union members. This rose dramatically through the Edwardian period, so that by the First World War, there were six and a half million trade unionists. During the long, hot summer of 1911, a series of dock workers strikes brought London to a standstill and had many in the establishment fearing revolution. A hundred years ago, this part of East London was home to thousands of people who used to work at the docks on the Thames. Now, this work was badly paid. Wages barely covered subsistence. To make matters worse, it was casual labour. The work was intermittent. If there was no work, there was no pay. It was in a room in some of the slums around here that an illiterate docker, a man called Ben Tillett, taught himself how to read and began to think how the dockers could unite to fight for better working conditions and a better standard of living. Ben Tillett was born into extreme poverty in Bristol in 1861. When he pitched up here in London looking for work on the docks, aged just 17, he was earning five pence an hour. Competition for work was cutthroat, while malnutrition and disease were commonplace. If you lived in the East End of London, your life expectancy was just 36. And for non-skilled workers such as dockers, there were no unions to fight for better working conditions a situation that a newly politicised and educated Tillett set out to rectify. Here in the museum in Docklands, there's a huge, a huge archive, which we've just dug out, um, about his trade unionism and political career. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. um, it shows what an important man he became. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and he started, though, in a sense, from small beginnings, you know, even in trade union terms, because he started off initially uh, organising uh, tea porters, basically, you know, men who un unloaded tea onto the, onto the docks and wharves um, in 1887. Um, and from there, of course, uh, you know, became more generalised to unionising uh, the workers across the, the docks as a whole. He talks about the first meeting, this sense yeah. of adrenaline and excitement. Um, my tongue was dry in my mouth and my throat was constricted, but I knew the meeting wanted direction, a clear indication of how to proceed. We wanted machinery, a base, a starting point, a controlling authority. And he talks about how he stammers, but he desperately got these words out. And there was a, a great acclaim, and he was put on two pounds a week and appointed secretary. Yeah, I mean, it's remarkable actually, you know, overcoming this uh, speech defect he had, because in the end, he becomes known as one of the most powerful and effective orators, you know, in the labour movement. Well, how did the establishment respond to these unions bursting out like this? They took the uh, the, the establishment, you say, the employees, and so on, completely by surprise. They almost took, I think, the leaders, Tillett himself, by surprise because. It almost starts as a spontaneous movement which suddenly spreads in this massive movement of unskilled uh, labour. His original small union eventually becomes the Dock, Wharf, Riverside and General Workers Union. Uh, and eventually they merge along with other unions to form uh, the Transport and General Workers Union, one of the biggest unions uh, in the history of British trade unionism. As leader of a burgeoning union, Tillett was on his way to becoming a national figure. He also had a sharp, strategic brain. His biggest battle with the maritime bosses was shrewdly timed. In 1911, Lloyd George and his fellow Liberals were once again at loggerheads with the House of Lords, this time over the Parliament Bill, which aimed to curb the power of the upper chamber. And so in the summer of 1911, with the ruling class at each other's throats, Tillett led the dockers out on strike. They put forward a demand here uh, to the employees in, in London for all sorts of improvements on their conditions, night conditions, meal times, times of call, minimum pay, so on and so forth. This is the sort of the opening salvo of the first stage of, of this dispute. It's a very British revolution, this. You know, we remain yours faithfully, and then Ben Tillett signs himself, and it's all, dear sir, politely addressed to the uh, Port of London Authority. But as you say, the, the conditions here, day conditions of working, 7 a.m. till 5 p.m., night conditions, 5 p.m. to 7 a.m. I mean, this is really laying down the kind of working conditions that, that have gone on to, to be enacted all through the 20th century. Tillett's strike soon went national. Combined with the crisis in Parliament, the whiff of revolution was in the air. August 1911 in particular, when it really comes to the boil, exceptionally hot summer, you know, the highest temperatures ever recorded, you've got strikes, you know, sort of sweeping up and down the country. But this is in the middle of the, the big political crisis that the Liberals were involved with in trying to get through their uh, kind of social welfare reforms. There's food stuff rotting uh, on the ships and in the warehouses in, 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 in London and then in Liverpool. Uh, you know, there's a real threat, you know, to one stage that there's going to be, uh, you know, kind of starvation on the street, especially in London. You know, there's no doubt that there was, uh, you know, for a brief two or three week period, uh, a feeling of real crisis here in society, I think. Look at this, a steamer lying at A Jetty in Victoria Dock with 40,000 carcasses of frozen meat on board. She's been in London 19 days. She's discharged part of her cargo. However, the last 10 days she's been idle owing to the strike. Her coal is running short. Yeah. It would be a serious matter should such a cargo as this become putrid in dock. Pretty hairy for a while. I mean, there were troops on the streets of Liverpool that just just held held back in London. Well, I mean, well, there was violence in Liverpool, without a doubt, and there were uh, police drafted in from Birmingham and elsewhere. There were various uh, regiments of troops brought into the city, and in, in some cases, with fixed bayonets. They had a naval ship moored in the Mersey just in case things got really out of control. On August the 13th, there was a large demonstration, became known as Bloody Sunday, um, where. Um, the police charged a very large crowd of supporting the transport strike and uh, many people were injured and so on and that really set off a, a several days of rioting in which um, two people were killed in fact. And yet, after such a build-up, there is no big dramatic conclusion. It has a very British ending. The employers give a bit, the unions take a bit and the Lords give in to the Liberals on the Parliament Act. 
crisis over. Industrial unrest continued for the next few years, but it was brought to an abrupt